So there was a young boy that went to a week at his grandparents' house who lived on the farm and went to spend some time with his grandparents. And he was looking around as this little boy was just looking at all the different animals out there on the farm. He was watching these little chickens and they were playing together. They were scratching in the dirt and they were playing. And he said, he goes, boy, they ain't got it. And he went on to the next animal and he seen this colt out there that was just born and he was kicking up his heels and, I mean, having fun. You could say, see that that colt was just having all kinds of a good time. And he looked at it and he goes, well, they ain't got it. And then he went through every single animal and he said, they ain't got it, they ain't got it. And then he went on and he finally went into the barn and he seen this old donkey. And this donkey was just standing there, had the sad face on, the big frown on his face, just looking there. And he said, he's got it, he's got it. And he says, Grandpa, come here, he's got it. His grandpa come running in there and he says, what's he got, son, what has he got? And he says, he's got the same kind of religion you got. That's good, wasn't it? You know, unfortunately, unfortunately, this is a large portion of Christians today. A lot of Christians walk around with that sad, droopy frown on their face, and you can't even tell that they're a Christian by the looks on their face. And that's an unfortunate thing. Or they're mean, or they're unapproachable, or they have that face on it that says, hey, do not disturb, leave me alone. Which reminds me of a marriage counselor that was actually talking to a couple people, and he was trying to get to the, the, the base of the problem, and he had the wife in there, and so he was probing her and asking her some questions so he could get a little bit better understanding for their situation. And he looked at her, and he says, in one of the series of questions, he says, hey, he said, did you, drink, or did you wake up grumpy today? And she said, I was going to, but I went ahead and let him sleep. <laughs> like that? You know, as Christians, we can be grumpy, we can be complainers, we can be belly acres, and I'm telling you what, it's not winning the world over. You can be, you can choose whatever attitude you want, but I'm telling you what, you're not, you're not doing anybody any favorites. People's not looking at your life, if that's you, and saying, hey, I want what you have. I want that. You know, the other night, it just so happened, uh, all these wonderful Bronco people that was over at our house, happens to be family from Colorado. Uh, anyway, they were over at our house, and Sam, my 10-year-old, he starts going down the list, and he starts going around every single one of us, and he starts telling us what animal we look like. And, and what, so that could all, you know, kind of be dangerous. So then it gets to my turn, and my boy says, you're a poodle. I said, a poodle? Man, I don't want to be a poodle. Why do I got to be a poodle? And he said, well, you're furry. I said, there's a lot of other animals that are furry besides a poodle. I don't want to be a poodle. So then he ended up calling me a, uh, a giraffe, said I was a giraffe. Well, you know, I don't want to be a big clumsy looking animal either. So then he finally said I was a lion. And I said, okay, that's it. Don't change anything else. I'll take the lion. But it took me three shots to get a lion. So I sat here thinking this, and the whole same spirit of that, here's what, you know, I decided to do. I decided to think about what animal a sour puss, you know, sad face, mean Christian looks like. And this is what I come up with right here. Where's it at? There it is, the grumpy cat. This is my happy face. Isn't that good? This is what I have to look at some Sundays. You know, we sat there and we got that grumpy look on our face, just acting like we just hate the world. And we hate the people in it, and we hate the circumstances we're going through in life. We just hate everything. We hate everything, and I tell you what, life just stinks, and we're grumpy, and then we go up, and then we tell people we're Christians. Let me tell you something, okay? Here's some good words of advice. If that's you, if this is your face, the grumpy face, if that's you most of the time, my advice to you is stop it. Just quit it. Quit looking like that. You don't have to look like that. And if you do look like that and you refuse to change your looks, then don't tell anybody you're a Christian. Just kind of keep it to yourself because I tell you what, people don't believe you. They don't believe you. See, as Christians, we need to have a joy, don't we? We need to have a joy that passes all understanding. We need to have a joy that just, when people look at our lives, it doesn't matter what we're going through, they got to see that. And they got to, and I'm not talking like a fake joy where you just walk around with some, you know, ridiculous looking grin on your face all day, just ignoring the situations that you're going through. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking that a real joy, a joy that we have. Today we're starting a, uh, a sermon series that we're going to take through Christmas. You can get the uh, happy face off right now so I can get everybody's attention. We're, we're going to go through uh, what I'm going to call a Christmas carol life. And each week we're going to focus on a different Christmas carol. And we're going to talk about how the theme of that 
Christmas carol can be applied to our life. So today we're going through Joy to the World. You know, we sang that song, and it was a beautiful song. And, you know, we sit there and we sing about joy to the world. The joy is Jesus. But on the other hand, we walk out these doors, and nobody has any idea the joy that we really truly have as a Christian. So we're going to focus on how we can have a joy that passes all understanding, how we can truly be a joy to the world. So as a believer, if we're going to possess the joy that we should have on the inside of us, my question that I want to answer today is, how can we be a joy to others without letting a belly aching world rub off on us? Because guys, we live in the real world, don't we? Not all of us live inside of a bubble. You know, I, I'm at the church pretty much full time, but I still work at uh, another job on Mondays. And I'm telling you, one of the biggest reasons I like that job is because it forces me out of the world. It forces me out among other people where I can still be out there. Because I'm telling you what, sometimes you can get inside of a Christian bubble and you can just, you know what, we can't do that. We got to get outside. We got to rub elbows. And every single one of us work with people. And here's what happens. Then people, you know, that are going through tough times, they start complaining, they start belly aching, and guess what happens to us? We end up sliding right on over, and we become the belly achers, we become the complainers right along with them, and nobody can tell. We got two people, one, one Christian, one not Christian, and you can't tell the difference between either one of them because they sucked us right into it. You know what's supposed to happen? What's supposed to happen, instead of us falling in, we're supposed to lift them out. What do you think God's got you there for? God's got you there not so you can join on a bandwagon. He's got you there because he wants you to lift people out of the stuff that they're going through in life. So how can we experience that joy? And that's the question that I really want to answer today. So we're going to be in the book of Philippians. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open it up to chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. We also are going to put it up on the screen, and then we also have it on the back of your bulletins. Starting with verse 1, this is what it says. The Apostle Paul says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you who I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this, dear friends. And I plead with Yodia, and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my two companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of the co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Number four, verse four, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Listen, guys, if we're going to have a joy in a world full of complainers, then I believe that there's a few things that we can learn from our text and we can apply them to our life. And on the back of your bulletin, I have an outline. And the first thing that we need to do is we need to keep on keeping on. That's what number one is. Keep on keeping on. Don't let the joy end. Don't let the joy in your life that you maybe once experienced, do not let it in, guys. Way too often, way too often, I see Christians throwing in the towel. We throw in the towel. Everything's going really, really good, and then all of a sudden, a monkey wrench gets thrown in our life, and we throw in the towel on our walk with God. That should not be. We cannot let the joy end. We've got to keep on keeping on. Things are going to get tough. They just are. That's just the way life is. But we do not need to let any of our circumstances rob us of the joy or throw in the towel and walk away from God. Listen to what in verse 1 Paul says. Paul says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you who I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord. Stand firm in the Lord. The words brothers and sisters and then also Paul's refers to him as joy and crown. He's telling the apostle Paul is addressing the church. He's addressing the church. He's saying, brothers and sisters, he's saying, you guys are my crown. You guys are my joy. And he's telling them, he says, to stand firm, church. So if he's telling these guys 2,000 years ago to stand firm, guess what he's telling us today? He's telling us the same thing. Guys, the Bible's not just a history book. It's for us today. And he's telling you, believers, stand firm. Don't throw in the towel. What does he mean when it says stand firm? The actual Greek word here that it's using, it actually 
it actually uh, gives the indication, it gives the picture of a soldier that has been given direct orders to stand firm. To stand his ground, don't tuck your tail and run. He's telling the soldier, he's giving them direct orders. When you're there, you can have people coming from the north, south, east, and west, and they're pulling in on you, and they're closing on you, you, and you have one order, and that's to stand your ground. Stay your post, don't back down, stand your ground, you've been given a direct order. That's the word that Paul's using here. He's saying, stand your ground, Christian. Do not back down. Don't tuck your tail and run. Stand your ground. Stand firm. There's several other scriptures that the Apostle Paul actually says this same speech and uses these same words. Listen to some of these. He tells the, uh, the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. He says, stand firm. Let nothing move you. So he tells them to stand firm. Let nothing move you. In 1 Corinthians 16, 13, he says, stand firm in your faith. In Galatians 5.1, he says, stand firm and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. In Ephesians 6.11, he says, take your stand against the devil's schemes. Ephesians 6.13, he says, having done everything to stand. In Ephesians 6.14, he says, stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. In Philippians 1.27, he says, stand firm in one spirit. In Colossians 4.12, he says, stand firm in all the will of God. In 2 Thessalonians 2.15, he says, stand Stand firm and hold the teachings to which was passed on to you. Listen, guys, I'm telling you what. He tells every single church, all these these letters that I just read, or all these scriptures that I just read, were actually letters to the church. He was telling the church in Thessalonica to stand firm. He was telling the church in Corinth to stand firm. In Colossae, he told them to stand firm. He told them to stand firm at the church of Galatia. He told every single one of them to stand firm. And he tells the church in Chillicothe to stand firm. Stand firm. Don't throw in the towel. Yeah, there's going to be junk in your life. You know how come the Apostle Paul was so adamant about telling every single church to stand firm? You know how come he did that? It's because he knows the devil. He knows the devil. He knows the devil's going to absolutely come on you. He knows that he's going to throw things at you. He knows that he's got your number. And he's going to make every single attempt he can to distract you, discourage you, and to defeat you. And if we let ourselves, I'm telling you what, that is exactly what happens. Because here's what happens. We're going out in life, and then all of a sudden the bullets of temptation start getting thrown at us. The arrows of temptation starts coming. Lust, greed, whatever. Fill in the blank with your problem, whatever it is. All the temptations start coming, and then you know what happens? We start taking our eyes off God. And we start letting that defeat us. We start letting all them things start getting us down. And Paul says, stand firm. Stand your ground. Don't let the devil devil trick you into taking off. Don't let him get you off base. Don't let that temptations of the world, whatever it is that you struggle with, don't let that throw you off. And then I'll tell you what else was going through Paul's mind. Paul knew that the circumstances in life creep in. Because it's not just temptation we we struggle with. We struggle with circumstances. We all go through them. We go through them on different levels, different circumstances. You know, somebody in our life dies that's close to us. You know, throws us off. We get mad. Somebody gets sick. They get diagnosed with cancer. That's a circumstance in life that's real, isn't it? And we deal with it. How do we deal with that? You know, our finances get tight. Starts feeling like we're carrying this overloaded weight around. We have no idea what's going on. We go through that. Our spouse leaves us. We have marriage problems. You know, sometimes just the daily monotonous routine of life, the day in, the day out grind of life, you know what I'm talking about? Sometimes that gets overwhelming and we start getting in that kind of that funk, you know? And we just want to throw in the towel and we just want to say, you know what? It's not even worth it because at one time, man, I was all excited for the Lord. But now God's just not doing it like he used to anymore. And we get bored. We get in that. You know, Paul says, stand your ground. Stand firm. Stay in the traces. Has anybody ever heard the term, stay in the traces? Back 150 years ago in the colonial days, there was a term that they called uh, stand in the traces. Stay in the traces. And is what that looked like is from get to one town to the next, the old wagon wheels, what they do, they didn't have pavement, and it'd make them big ruts. It'd make a big rut into the, in the trails. And as what a good wagon driver would do, the rag, they called them big ruts, traces. 
And a good wagon driver, he would get that wagon wheels and he'd put them right in the traces. And he would just stay in the traces and he'd let the horses do all the work. He wouldn't even have to steer them. And that thing would go, the, the, his wagon would go straight to where it was going because it just stayed in the traces. Guys, so many times in our life, we want to get off course. We want to get off paces. We want to jump the traces. We want to get out of the traces because we just get bored of doing that same old thing. And then we end up making a really, really stupid decision. We need to keep on keeping on. We need to stay in the traces of life. You know what? Um, I'm telling you what. There's a lot of times over these last 14 years that I wanted to jump the traces. But just was. Haven't yet. And I'm not going to. Hopefully. Praise God. Hopefully. But if I take my eyes off Jesus, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to jump the traces. But I don't want to. You know, sometimes it gets boring. Sometimes it gets that day in, day out grind. Sometimes I don't feel like praying. Sometimes I don't feel like opening the Word of God. But I know the importance of it. So I want to stand firm. I want to stand my ground, and I want to keep on keeping on, guys. Don't jump the traces. Too many times I've seen too many people throw in the towel too fast. I'm telling you, husband, stand firm. Wife, stand firm. Children, parents, student, worker, Wherever you find yourself in, if you do anything or if you hear of one thing that I say today, in the name of Jesus, I tell you to stand firm. Stand firm. You know what? You have no idea if you throw in the towel right now, you have no idea what God might have done with your life. Have no idea. Me and Rhonda was just thinking about this the other day, and we just was feeling overwhelmed. You know, my kids are truly amazing. I got great kids. They don't, they're not perfect. They mess up. They mess up all the time. But I just sit there and think about what my kids might look like had me and Rhonda never made that decision or we jumped the traces a long time ago. It's not always going to be easy. you got to stand your ground and you keep on going, keeping on because it's all, I'll tell you what, it's all worth it. Don't throw in the towel. So if we're going to be a joy in this world with a bunch of belly acres and complainers around us that we need to stand firm. But number two, number two, is we need to get over it. We need to get over it. Listen, church, throughout your life, you're going to experience some difficult people. Raise up your hand if you've experienced somebody difficult. Don't look at your spouse. We all have, haven't we? We've, we've experienced difficult people in our life. <clears throat> I come across a t-shirt and it says this. It says, we live in a world of smartphones and stupid people. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Anybody know a stupid person? <laughs> no? You know what? We do. We, we cross paths with people like that all the time. Can I just tell you that you're not always going to see eye to eye on things? You're just not. You're not going to see eye to eye on every single thing. So you need to learn how to just deal with it and get over it. Get over it. Because I'm telling you what, it's messing up your life. It's taking the joy out of your life. And it's messing up and it's throwing you off. And it's jumping you out of the traces. So over the, in these next few verses, we see that Paul is, is dealing with a couple of ladies that can't seem to get along. They can't seem to get along. Look what verse 2 and 3 says. Paul says, I plead with you, Yodia, and I plead with you, Syntyche, to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. So Paul has to plead with these two ladies, and they appear to be leaders in the church to get along. He has to plead with them. He said, these ladies were by my side. They advanced the gospel. These girls were Christians. They were Christians. And all of a sudden, they come into something and they can't get along. And Paul has to beg them to get along. He's pleading with them. Please, get along. Have you been around people that don't get along? How does that make you feel? Uncomfortable, doesn't it? It does. I've been around husbands and wives before that start fighting and it's like, ugh. You know, you start getting real, it starts getting real tense. It starts getting heated. Or have you many of you worked with people where two people aren't getting along? It makes it heated, doesn't it? It makes it real tense. My kids, they, you know, they get in arguments, especially Sam and Lucy, and they start fighting. And I plead with them. I beg them. Can't we just get along? <laughs> because I tell you what, it's not very enjoyable when they're fighting. Paul's pleading with these two ladies that can't get along. And he said, guys, come on. You know, we need to get over it. And he's pleading with them. He's pleading with them. Let me give you an interesting fact, a couple of them, about the meaning of these ladies' names. This is pretty cool. 
back then, too, names really had meanings. People, I mean, they were, they were named and they had, they had meanings. But, you know, I don't even know what mine means now, but it's not as big a deal today as it used to be back then. But Yodia, Yodia means sweet smell. Yodia means sweet smell. And Syntyche means friendly. <laughs> sweet smell and friendly. Now, I don't know about you, and I don't know for sure what happened, but Miss Sweet Smell and Miss Friendly wasn't acting very smell good and very sweet and very friendly, were they? They wasn't living up to their name very good, and the Apostle Paul pleaded with them to stop. Now, I wonder, I wonder if 2,000 years ago, if these ladies would have known that their names were going to be written in the greatest word ever, the Bible. I wonder if they would have changed their attitudes. Could you imagine going down in history, being known as the two ladies in the church that couldn't get along, and Paul pleaded with you to get along? Guys, I'm telling you what, 2,000 years later, preachers are still preaching on this scripture. I'm telling you what, your life affects. It doesn't just affect now, but it's going to boil over into tomorrow and the next week and the next week. And I'm telling you what, if it festers long enough, it's going to be a really bad deal. We need to learn how to get along. We need to learn how to get over it. Yeah, but you have no idea what they did to me. You have no idea how mean they are. You have no idea what they said, what they did. No, I don't. I really don't. But here's something to think about. One of the meanest or the toughest animals in the forest is the grizzly bear. And the grizzly bear could probably take out any of his opponents by one swap of his massive paw. There's one animal that the grizzly bear will not mess with. He won't mess with him. And in fact, he's even been known to even share a meal with this animal that he doesn't like that he could take out with one swipe. Does anybody know what that animal is? Well, let's see if Josh was paying attention to the first service. What's that animal? Skunk. skunk. A skunk. He could take him out with one blow, but he doesn't because sometimes I think he realizes that it's not worth the stink. It's not worth the stink. You know what? I believe you've got some skunks probably in your life. You probably do. But you've got to ask yourself, is it worth the stink? You know, sometimes you've got to figure out how to just get over it. It's not worth making a bigger deal out of it than it has to be. And most of the times... We make a bigger deal out of it than it has to be. It's just the way it is. We do. So if we're going to be a joy in the world, we need to make some right decisions, and we just need to get over a few things. We just do. Especially, especially if you're in the church and you're arguing with another Christian in the church. Get over it. Get over it. Let it go. I'm telling you what, we're not winning an unbelieving world over when the church is just fighting and belly aching and bickering behind the doors. Get over it. Number three. Number three, if we're going to be a joy to the world, then we need to decide to rejoice. We need to decide to rejoice. I believe it's a choice. Paul's third command is actually quite simple, isn't it? In verse four, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Now, even though that this is short, simple, and to the point, it might be the most difficult thing that we have to deal with. It might be the most difficult thing that we have to apply to our life. W.C. Fields said this, he said, I start off each day with a simple smile and get it over with. <laughs> Don't you just feel like that sometimes? Listen, guys, when Paul gave the command to rejoice, he didn't just say it once, did he? He repeated it. He said, rejoice. Again, I tell you to rejoice. Rejoice. Listen, guys, it's the only command that Paul did, gives that he repeats twice. I believe that um, he knew that we are going to have some struggles in our life. I believe that Paul knew that we were going to have some difficult people in our life. I believe that Paul knew that we were going to have some difficult circumstances in our life. So Paul was encouraging us and reminding us to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. You know, the problem most of us face are defining the difference between being happy and having joy. A lot of times we want our circumstances to dictate whether we're happy or whether our joy is based. Can I tell you, my circumstances doesn't dictate where my joy comes from. Our circumstances, if we let our emotions and our circumstances dictate whether we're happy or whether we have a joy, then I'm telling you, that's where we get that up and down, that emotional roller coaster ride. Because I'm telling you what, one day is good, we're happy. One day's bad, we're, we're sad. You know, we wake up one day, we're happy, and then 10 minutes later, we get to work, and we've got the skunks in our life, and we're not happy no more. It's a choice. It's a choice to rejoice and rejoice in the Lord always. You know, when Paul wrote this to the, the, to the Philippian church, uh, to the church at Philippi, he was actually considered a book of joy. 
Because he uses the word joy several times throughout Philippians. So we would think in our life, we would think, you know what, Paul's probably on this mountaintop experience right now. Paul's probably experiencing the best of his ministry he's ever been. Can I tell you that when the Apostle Paul wrote the book of joy, he was actually chained to a Roman soldier 24 hours a day, and he was waiting his death penalty. Isn't that crazy? Could you imagine being on death row, chained to a soldier, and you write in the book of joy. I would say he didn't have joy in the circumstances that he was in. I would say Paul dug down deep and had a joy that passes all understanding. He had a joy that wasn't based on the circumstances. Isn't that right? I don't know any of us right here on death row. Paul said to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Rejoice. Fanny Crosby wrote over 8,000 hymns. Some of them, probably a lot of you know, Blessed Assurance, Praise Him, Praise Him, To God Be the Glory, were just a few of them. She lost her sight when she was only six weeks old. Six weeks old. So she lived her whole life blind. And she lived into her 90s composing thousands of hymns. And on her 92nd birthday, she cheerfully said this. She said, if in, if in all the world you can find a happier, more joyous person than I, then do bring him to me because I would like to shake his hand. She found a joy that passes all understanding. She could have been a bitter, bitter old maid. But instead she wrote over 8,000 hymns about praising God. Isn't that amazing? I would say that she understood the meaning of rejoicing in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. So quit your belly aching and just decide to rejoice. Decide. It's that simple. Decide you're going to rejoice. It's an absolute choice. It's a choice. Quit looking at your circumstances and letting them control you. Number four. Number four, if we're going to have a joy in the world, then we need to have a gentle spirit. We need to have a gentle spirit. Paul continues to deal with conflict in a godly manner. And he says this in verse 5. He said, let your gentleness be evident to all that the Lord is near. So in the middle of this conflict, we're supposed to be gentle. We're supposed to be gentle people. We need to win your enemies over with gentleness. Scripture says a gentle answer turns away wrath. So if someone doesn't like you, and you don't like, and you think they're out to get you, guess what you're supposed to do? Show them gentleness. Can I get an amen? amen? Isn't that exciting? Somebody don't like you, and they're out to get you, and make your life miserable? And he says, let your gentleness be known to everyone. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We're just supposed to be gentle people. Supposed to be gentle. Listen, guys, the word translated gentle here is probably best understood as yielded rights. Yielded rights. It means we are to be gentle or yielded people. That means we should not let people uh, tick us off and get us bent out of shape. Because that's what happens, isn't it? When something doesn't go our way, I'm telling you what, we get ticked off, we get bent out of shape, and everybody else is going to pay for it, aren't they? That's the way it is. That's the way it happens. And it's, it's, Paul says can't. You can't do that. See, it happens that way because we demand our rights. Isn't it? Think about all the times that you've gotten mad. We want to demand our rights. Because my right was violated. My right was violated, and I have a right to this. So you know what? Mm, I'm going to get, I'm going to stand up, and I'm going to stand firm. You guys know how to stand firm. You're just standing firm in the wrong stuff. But we stand our ground, and I'm telling you what, you back us in the corner, we're going to come out swinging. And that's the way we do it, because we demand our rights. Listen, guys, on a complete, total different level, but I want you to think about this. What's going on in the media right now, all this week, and everything that we've heard? What's everybody been listening to and watching? Ferguson. What is that all about? It's all about people demanding their rights, isn't it? They're demanding their rights because they were wronged in their mind. And it doesn't matter where you line yourself up with, and it doesn't matter about your opinion, and it doesn't matter anything about it. It still boils down to the fact these people are ticked, they're demanding their rights, and they're going to riot, they're going to loot, they're going to do whatever they want to do, they're going to tear stuff up because they're going to demand their rights, and they're going to make the whole world hear about it, and it's even taking place in other states, not just there in Ferguson, but it's going on all over the place. Can I just tell you 
Can I just tell you, we could sit here all we want and we can watch the news and we can say, man, that's terrible the way they're acting. But you know what? We do that. We do that on a total different level. You know, we might not be out there writing, getting our picture on the paper, but you know what we're doing? We're demanding our rights in our marriage. We're standing our ground. We're demanding our rights in our relationships, in our jobs, in everything that we're doing. And I'm telling you what, we're not a very gentle spirit. And we might not sit there and think that we're doing as much damage as they're doing in Ferguson, but you know what? We're, we're killing our relationships. We are. We're burning them to the ground. All because we're demanding our rights. Well, praise the Lord, you won the battle, but you lost the war. Apostle Paul says, let your gentleness be known to all. We need to have a gentle spirit, guys. We need to quit demanding our rights. So let me ask you a question. Because I want you to kind of filter these through your life, and I want you to think about this for just a little bit. How do you respond when you feel like you're cheated out of something? Somebody cheats something out of you, how do you feel? What's your first response? You don't have to answer out loud. I'm just thinking to you personally. Think about that, how you feel. Is your first reaction, oh, they cheated me. I got to get that back. That's mine. That belongs to me. And I'm willing to fight for it, do whatever. Is that how you act when you're cheated out of something? This is going to be just a good reminder and make you understand whether you have a gentle spirit or whether you don't. Let me ask you something else. How do you respond when people rub you the wrong way? How do you respond when people rub you the wrong way? Would the people that know you best consider you a gentle person? Would the people that consider you, you know you best consider you a gentle person? Would your kids, would your spouse, would your close relatives, would they consider you a gentle person? I don't even remember what the conversation was yesterday, but me and Lucy was having this conversation, and Lucy said, Dad, you're just way too nice. And now I'm not way too nice, but I, I asked Lucy, I said, Lucy, can you ever be way too nice? Can you ever be too nice? Guys, what do people say about you? Does your family, do they look at you as a gentle person? Or do they look at you as a hothead that's getting ready to blow and you don't want to push dad's buttons? Okay. Now, it's kind of easy sometimes to be nice and be gentle around people that you love. But what about people that do not like you? That you don't like? That you have maybe a disagreement with? Would they consider you a gentle person? Would they? Paul says we need to have a gentle spirit. We need to be, let our gentleness be known and evident to all. If we are constantly on the edge and ready to blow our top, then here's what my suggestion is to you guys. Is you need to pray to God for a gentle spirit. Pray to Him. Ask Him. Tell God. Say, you know what? I'm always constantly wanting to demand my rights. I'm constantly wanting to blow up. I'm on the edge. I'm angry all the time. You know what? Make that a matter of prayer. Say, God, I don't want this. Take this away from me. Let me to have a gentle spirit. Help me to have a gentle spirit. Help me to see others the way that you do. And get up every single day and make an effort to you remind yourself that you need to be gentle. Remind yourself. Because I'm telling you, sometimes without reminders, you can forget all about it until you hear the next message. The best way to do it is to apply it right to your life and do it on a daily basis. So we need to be gentle. Number five is that we need to take everything to the Lord. We need to take everything to the Lord. In verses 6 and 7, the Apostle Paul says, he says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Everyone wants more peace, right? Everyone want more peace in your life? It does. I'm telling you what, peace is a good thing. I'm telling you, when there's chaos and there's peace, I'd choose peace anytime. Everybody wants more peace in their life. Well, the Apostle Paul says, be anxious for nothing. That's how you get more peace. That's one of the ways. Be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about anything. Simple, right? Don't worry about anything. Isn't that great? Everybody's got that mastered, don't they? I don't worry about a thing. That's a lie. We all do. We worry about it. But Paul says, don't. He says, quit worrying about stuff. Quit being anxious about everything. <coughs> it's easier said than done, but worrying is a waste of energy. It's a complete waste of energy. <coughs> True story. There's a guy by the name of David Page. <coughs> 
and he lives in England. And he was actually out digging. And when he dug down, he ended up noticing something. And when he picked it up and he looked at it, what appeared to be was an unexploded bomb from World War I. And so he's sitting here and he's got this bomb in his hand that never went off that he just dug up. And now he's faced with the decision, what the heck do I supposed to do about it? So he was afraid to set it back down because he was afraid if he put it back down, it would blow up. He didn't want to move very much because he was afraid it would blow up. So he sits there and he very, very carefully put his hand in his pocket and he pulled out his cell phone. And the first thing he did was called 911. So the 911 dispatch operator kept saying, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. And he said, you're not the one holding a bomb. You know, he was worried about it. So they sent uh, first responders to him. And while they were waiting, while he was waiting in that four-hour period, he ends up getting on the phone, and he calls his family, and he tells us his goodbyes to the family in case this goes south, because he's wanting all of them to understand he loves them, and he was wanting to talk to them about all this. First responders get there. They've got everybody away. And then the bomb squad finally gets there. And when the bomb squad got up there, it ended up being identified as a part of a hydraulic suspension system from an old European car. Isn't that crazy? Is there anything you guys are overreacting about? Because I tell you what, we overreact a lot about a lot of things. We, we overreact. We think the worst of absolutely everything. We think we're holding this time bomb. We think that there's no way out of it. And God's saying, dude, it's another part. It's not even a bomb. But that's us. That's us. We automatically think the worst. We overreact in absolutely anything. Is there anything in your life that you're worrying about right now that you need to let go of? You need to let go of. There was a research study done one time by a college. 40% of the things that we worry about never happen. 40% of the things that we worry about never happen. 30% concern the past. How many of you can change the past? You can't, can you? 12% are needless worries about our health. 10% are on petty issues. And there's only 8% of the things that we uh, worry about that are actually legit concerns. 8%. So 92% of our worrying is just wasted time, wasted energy. 92% of the things that we worry about don't even come true. Worry is stewing without doing. Worry is so wrong because you are assuming that God can't take care of you. Guys, if you're a believer, we come to the Lord. And when we come to the Lord, we say a prayer, something like this. We say, God, I believe in you. I believe you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross. I believe that he rose from the dead. I believe he's alive right now. God, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. Save me. Give me the strength that I need to walk on a daily basis. I surrender my life to you. And then we go through situations and we say, Whoa, God, you're big enough to save me? but you're not big enough to get me through this, so I think I'm just going to keep this and worry about it on my own. How terrible is that, guys? If God's big enough to save us, don't you think He's big enough to get us through whatever it is that we're worrying about? We need to let it go. We're not going to experience peace as long as we waste all of our emotional energy on things that we have no control over. Now, I'm not making light on anybody's situation because I know we all have challenges that we're faced with. I know we go through seasons of our life that we don't understand how things are going to turn out. <clears throat> I know we got people dealing with health problems, job problems, school problems, finance problems, marriage problems, family problems, relationships problems. You have big decisions that you need to be made. I know people are faced with all this, guys. I'm not making light of it. I'm not making light of it at all. But here's my question. Do you know for certain what the future will bring concerning any of these issues? Do you? We don't, do we? We do not know what the future is going to bring. Let me ask you another question. Can worrying about these things change your circumstances? They can't, can they? <clears throat> then why do we worry? Corey Ten Boom said this. She said, worry does, does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. It empties today of its strength. Listen, friend, the past is done. The future is not yet. Why are we letting worry run the present? It's the only moment we have. The only moment you guys have to change anything in your life, to make a difference in somebody's life is right now. It's the only moment we have. And we let worry ruin our moment. Ruin our moment. We need to give it to God. Worry and prayer are completely opposite. It's like water and fire. It's completely opposite. You can worry or pray, but you can't do both of them at the same time. 
It's impossible to pray and worry at the same time. Paul gives us a few tips. He says we need to pray about everything. He says we need to pray with thanksgiving. And we need to pray with expectation. <clears throat> Martin Luther gives a story. He's talking about his puppy that was at the table. And he said the puppy was sitting there at the table. And that puppy just kept looking at that morsel of food with such intensity. It just kept looking at it. It would not take his eyes off of it. And he's, as he sat there and looked at his puppy, looking at that, he knew that that was the only thought that was going through his mind. He was only focused. That was the only hope. That was the only everything that he had. He just kept staring at that. And Martin Luther said, man. He said, man, if I could just pray with the way this dog watches the mill, all of, this, all of his thoughts are concentrated on this piece of meat. Otherwise, he has no thought or any hope. What he's saying is if we could just focus on God, like a dog's going to focus on that piece of meat, just think of how your circumstances can life, change in life. That's what prayer is. It's spending everything. It's every focus, every thought is filtered through Christ, and it's letting Him deal with your situation instead of letting us deal with it. Because when we look at it, we make things a mess. We need to have that same concentration on the Lord. <clears throat> and when we do, when we do, He takes our burdens to Him. When we take our burdens to Him, then He places them, He replaces them with something better. Look at what verse 7 says. <clears throat> It says, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The word God, guard here is actually another military for, uh, term referring to a soldier guarding the city gate from the inside. So in other words, when we pray, God's peace becomes the guard of our heart. When we pray, God's peace becomes the guard of our heart and he protects us from the cares of this world that is meant to destroy us. We need to pray so God's peace will guard our hearts, guys. That's the only thing way we're going to have the joy in all circumstances. <clears throat> now, if we're going to be people of joy, we must take everything to the Lord. But finally, number six, is we need to stop our stinking thinking. <clears throat> Isn't that good? Stop your stinking thinking. Because that's what it boils down to. It boils down to our thoughts, what we're thinking of, how it's leading us. You know, most of the times our mind's default mode is to go to the worst. Every situation, go to the worst. The people we come in contact with, we go to the worst. It's kind of our default mode. Everything goes there, whatever it is, whatever comes our way, comes to the worst. And if we're ever going to have real joy, then we need to stop it. Our passage ends with Paul saying this in verse 8. <clears throat> He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if there's any excellent or praiseworthy, then think about these things. Listen, guys, your thoughts are going to direct the outcome of your life. They just absolutely are. You might think, I don't believe that. Well, let me give you something to chew on. Listen to this. The average person has a minimum of 10,000 separate thoughts each day. A minimum of 10,000. That works out to 3.5 million thoughts a year. And if you live to be 75, that you'll have over 26 million different thoughts. Already today, most of you all already has had over 2,000 thoughts. And before you lay your head down at night, you're going to have 8,000 more. Isn't that amazing? No wonder we're exhausted. <laughs> I lay my head down sometimes, and I'm telling you what, I'm drained. Because we can't shut our minds off. We're constantly thinking. We're thinking, we're thinking, we're thinking, and we're worrying, and we're worrying, and we're thinking the worst of every situation. So we're going to think. And I'm telling you what, in your mind, sin begins. But guess what also begins in your mind? Holiness. Holiness. You can be dictated and directed by sin, or you can be directed by holiness and desire a life that is sold out to God. Listen, church, your thoughts are important. Your thoughts are important. And if you've got some stinking thinking, then you need to get rid of it. And every thought you need to take captive, throw out what's not of God, and you need to get rid of it. And you need to focus on whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, whatever's excellent or praiseworthy. And then verse 9 is great news because it says the God of peace will be with us. Hallelujah. Isn't that awesome? Praise team, go ahead and come. I'm telling you what, I don't want my life dictated by worry and stress and complaining and bitterness and ugliness. we got to walk with God. If we're believers, we need to look different. We need to act different. We need to speak different. Guys, listen to me. Both the hummingbird and the vulture 
both fly over to the, the desert. They both fly over the des desert. But you know what the vulture preys on? You know what it looks for? It looks for the dead carcasses to go do that. You know what the hummingbird does? The hummingbird doesn't stop at the dead carcasses. It goes and finds the blossom somewhere in the desert. And it finds its refreshment, and it finds it from that. But here's the point. Both the vulture and both the hummingbird both find what they're looking for. They both find what they're looking for. What bird do you classify yourself with? The vulture? Are you looking for the junk in life? Are you looking for the dead in life? Are you looking for the worst case scenario in life? Are you looking to all the stuff that has no life that's only going to ruin and condemnation and, and, and have all that junk on you? Or are you the hummingbird? Are you looking for the good things in life? Are you looking for God in life? Are you looking for people that you can minister to? Are you looking for... We both find what we're looking for. We do. It's your perspective. It's your thoughts. It's how you're going. Guys, if we're going to be a joy to the world... We need to keep on keeping on. We need to get over it. We need to decide to rejoice, have a gentle spirit, take everything to the Lord, and stop our stinking thinking. Guys, God has given us assignment in Chillicothe, Missouri, and that's to reach the people that's not going to church anywhere, to reach the people that aren't, don't have the Lord in their life. I can't do it. One person can't do it. Three people can't do it. Five people can't do it. But you know what? A church this size, we can reach a lot of people. We can reach a lot of people not to fill a seat, but to change lives. To change lives because we have a joy that's living on the inside of us. We used to be that vulture. And now we're experiencing life in a different way. And that should be our desire, is to help other people and teach them how they can experience a real joy in life. Would you stand with me and rise to your feet, please? Guys, I'm telling you, there's absolutely no way you can experience that joy apart from Jesus Christ. Everything else is going to be a temporary fix. I want us to bow our heads and close our eyes right now. And I just want to ask you a question. Do you know that you know that you know?